The synthesizer, the defining musical instrument of the electronic age. Since the sound of synthesizers gained popularity in the 1970s, the use of electronic and computer technology for music arrangement and synthesis has become an inextricable part of our musical culture. Yet the first truly complete music synthesizer was conceived nearly 20 years earlier by engineers at the RCA Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey. Dr. Alex Magoon of the IEEE History Center tells the story. Harry Olson was the director of the Acoustics Laboratory at the RCA Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey. And in the early 1930s, he developed what's known as the Velocity Microphone. Um, it's an iconic microphone, which became the standard for a lot of studio recording because it was very directional. In the late 1940s, television is beginning to take off. So now you've got to provide content, you need to provide music. One of Olson's associates, Herbert Ballar, I believe, began to put these issues together about, well, could we synthesize music? The idea of eliminating, you know, session costs for each of those orchestra players uh, with some sort of electronic machine that you can hire one person to input, a, a skilled musician composer, uh, must have seemed like a, a very tempting proposition. General Sarnoff makes sort of the debut of this uh, Mark I in January 1955. And I think in some ways it was Harry Olson's effort to say, this is my anniversary present to the general for 50 years in electronics because he was also responsible for color videotape. The synthesizer had no keyboard and could not be played in real time. Instead, musical information would be recorded as punched holes in a large paper tape. This would then be run through a mechanical reader, which operated the synthesizer through a system of relays. Additional parameters had to be painstakingly set up using over 250 manual controls. A dual-tier record cutting lathe was built. The first tier had six cutting heads, each of which would be used to record two notes at a time. They would then be mixed down to the lower tier, engraving the final mix of all 12 parts onto the master record. At some point, RCA Victor says, so what do you have to do to compose a three minute or a 10 minute musical piece? You've got to spend four weeks doing this, input the seven different parameters for each note, and apparently just say, we're not buying this. The experimental LP record had certainly made the rounds in, in New York City, where young Bob Moog is, is hanging out with people in this sort of new electronic music scene. And the prospect for Columbia, I imagine, of having a state-of-the-art, all-electronic, <laughs> any sound you can imagine type device must have been uh, very exciting. of that time um, was being experimented with was the 12-tone type of music. It was called serialist music, so people would, you would come up with these tone rows. It's very difficult to write compositions in that you had to use all the 12 notes in the proper sequence, make sure that those rows were repeated and juxtaposed in different ways. So obviously if you had a computer, it was going to be a lot easier to create those tone rows. The truth must be known, Harry Olson wasn't interested in music. They invited Vladimir Usachevsky and me to come here and investigate the machine. Vladimir had no relation to such things. He was, of course, at that time, one of the best known practitioners of tape music. The fact that I once taught in the math department at Princeton made me a little more able to deal with the literature at that time. The motivations for most of us who worked with it were purely musical. There came that moment when they wanted to dump the machine. And we knew that. They told us, they said, they don't, we don't know what to do with it. When you see the synthesizer and you saw enough as you realize, of course, it was a huge machine and we had to sort of tuck it in. It's just in this room at Columbia. By the 1960s, when integrated circuits are coming in, making solid state synthesizers a reality, there's no interest in subsidizing Harry Olson, who by this point is on the verge of retirement. 
So Harry, in his notebooks and some of his reports, is proposing, look, we can do a solid state music synthesizer, desktop synthesizer for the home. He's got all the marketing. He understands the game. And RCA is simply completely uninterested, which leaves it obviously to Moog and, and other people we recognize as pioneers now. Dr. Babbitt said, look at all this time and research and energy that has gone into the creation of electronic music and all we have is these lousy ringtones on our fence. <laughs> you know, it's become sort of cliche and annoying and, you know, it's never really been the type of thing that, that you know, people have felt a, the same fondness for as, say, the sound of symphony orchestra or even just a single violin. I think that, um, Harry Olson, from an engineering standpoint, he'd be pretty interested in all the stuff that um, was created. You look at it, you look at the record, um, you look at the fact that it went to New York City, there's a huge electronic music group there, people win Pulitzer Prizes making compositions. I think David Sarnoff would say, well, we pioneered this, but we have gone on to other fields and, and domains. We've created an industry and let other people fill it. Sarnoff might also say we also created a new art, <laughs> just as the television art, the radio art, now the synthesizer art. So in that way you see art and industry together.